Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Central Baptist Church. If you will find your seats this morning and stand, and go with me in your hymnal to hymn 245, the old account was settled. Hymn 245. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and sold it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, the old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle. I settled it long ago, long ago long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, when in that happy home, my Savior home's above, I'll sing redemption story and praise him for his love. I'll not forget that book with pages white as snow, because I came and settled Sell it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, oh sinner, trust the Lord, be cleansed from all your sin. For thus he hath provided for you to enter in. And then I should should live a hundred years below. But there you'll not regret it. You sell it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. Let's bow in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne today, Lord, praising you for who you are, that you are an all-wise God, an all-loving God, and Lord, with thy presence here with us today, we thank you for that. Thank you for your constant love. Thank you for your long-suffering in our lives, Lord, how good you are to us. Thank you for the health that we have to be able to assemble together this morning. And we pray, Father in heaven, that you would be pleased to meet with us, and Lord, that you would use your word, and our pastor, as he preaches your word, that God, you would speak to our hearts this morning, that Lord, we would be drawn near to thee, that Lord, if there's anybody here today without Christ, that they would understand how much you love them, and that they would come to you and be saved. But I pray, Lord, that your people would be blessed and strengthened today, Help our pastor, God, just fill him with your spirit. Speak through him to us today, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. What are y'all doing? We're breaking tradition today, ain't we? All right, if you go to your hymn book, to hymn number 24, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? Hymn 24. Two. 
You can be seated. Good morning. Good to see everyone today on this nice, blustery, well, it's actually warm this morning, amen, compared to what it has been and looking forward to some of that warm weather they're talking about us getting this week, amen. Well, I'm ready for it, whether you are or not, and, uh, and those nice, calm breezes that we're supposed to get this week. But, uh, I'll take the breeze if we get some warmth. I'm not too hip on those breezes with the cold weather, but I can take it with some warm weather. Well, it's good to see everyone today. If you're visiting with us for the first time or you haven't been here in a month or so, if you'll slip your hand up and let our ushers come by and give you a visitor's card, if they haven't done that already, in just a little while we'll sing a song and then have an offering. And you can drop that card in the offering plate so we'll have a record of your visit with us today. Good to have some returning visits back with us. Larry and Belinda and uh, Jesse right back there on the back, back with us again this morning. And what was your name, sir? J.W. and good to have you all with us this morning. Amen. And good to see everybody else as well. And I'm looking forward to a good service this morning. Um, don't forget that there are new Revival Fires newspapers back there, and also the Baptist Bread is back on the back table. There is a sign-up sheet also on the back table for the ladies. I'm not a very good lip reader. <laughs> so what did you say? Nothing? Okay. Anyway, there is a sign-up sheet in the back uh, for the ladies to sign up for the spring... Ladies Fellowship, and the theme of it is Spring Cleaning for Heart and Soul. Well, that's going to be fun, amen. By the way, does anybody need a bulletin? I forgot to ask that a while ago. If you do not have a bulletin, I'm rushing our ushers around back there. Uh, hey, good to see the Englands come in this morning. Good to have you back with us today. All right. If you do need a bulletin, just keep your hand up, and they'll get by and get you that in just a moment. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries for the week. Uh, Brother Moore, he's off celebrating in Colorado because his great-grandson has a birthday around the same time. So, And then Brother Dan Croker on the 11th. Wrong month. <laughs> Wrong month? Oh, it's supposed to be in April. May. May. <laughs> well, happy early birthday, amen. And then Miss Samantha Looney and then Brother Dan and Miss Marcella Maxwell have an anniversary this week. So how many years, Brother Maxwell? 53 today. Well, happy anniversary. Amen. Then the nursery schedule's in there. The missions giving, praise the Lord, was back up last week, and we have gotten back ahead. Praise the Lord for that. It was very disappointing to see red on there, wasn't it? But praise the Lord, we're out of the red, and we're back ahead, so keep up the good work with that. And uh, don't forget to set your clocks ahead this coming Saturday or Sunday. If you want to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do that, that's your business. I do it before I go to bed, amen, just as long as it gets done. Uh, then don't forget uh, the 15th through the 19th, for those that need to know, is the CBCA spring break. Yeah, the teachers are all excited about that, amen. And I'm looking forward to that. And then March the 20th at 5 o'clock is a youth activity, nachos and games. And then April the 4th is our Resurrection Sunday celebration. Amen. And we'll just have normal services all day. Uh, then the 11th through the 14th of April is GSA, God Save America Regional Conference. And uh, looking forward to that. And we're putting a church planting emphasis in the GSA. If we're going to reach America, we need more churches. Amen. Amen. So we're going to emphasize church planning uh, and probably keep that emphasis every year in our conference. That'll make us even more unique among the GSA conferences. And speaking of GSA, Wednesday night, uh, we just mentioned that we needed uh, basically 21 nights of hotel rooms. That's three to five nights for the different speakers, depending on when they come in, okay? And all of them together equals about 21 nights that we need to pay for uh, for the GSA meeting. 
And Wednesday night, we had 11 of those rooms committed. So this morning, I just want to mention it again, that if you would be willing to pay for one night in a hotel room, it's $90. And if you're willing to do that, we just need 10 more people or 10 more families uh, to commit to taking care of the hotel rooms, and they'll all be taken care of. My wife and I will put ours in the offering today. And if anybody be willing to do that, Brother Maxwell, you'll take care of one. Mrs. Croker, did I see another hand? Brother Jonathan, that's three. Marissa, four. Wow, we got boys over here going to pay for a hotel room. Amen. <laughs> Mrs. Gustin, <laughs> I don't think he was volunteering to pay for a room. Uh, who else did I see? Okay, you got Mrs. Gustin, Mrs. Cruz. Even our visitor, Mr. J.W., is going to take care of one, he said. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, how many is that? Seven. We need three more. Brother McBride will take care of one. Brother Victor, that's two. One more. Brother Bristow, amen. Thank you very much. That's all taken care of, amen. And that's a blessing. And it helps our, our guest preachers to have a nice, comfortable, and their wives. Most of them are bringing their wives this year. Isn't that a blessing, ladies? It's always good to have the preachers around, but then the ladies would like to have the wives around too. So most all of them are bringing their wives this year. So we're excited about that. And so looking forward to that. Uh, praise the Lord. I do not think I have any other announcements, but I do have some instruction. Amen. <laughs> Woo -hoo, instruction. We, uh, we are going to reinstate our handshake song now right well actually right now what we're going to do we'll do it a little different than we've done it in the past uh, but we'll stand for the song that we will have in preparation for receiving the offering and we'll sing the first verse and chorus then we'll go shake hands and then the song leader will come back and probably guide us through the chorus to get everybody back in their place, and then we'll sing the last verse and chorus. And on the last verse and chorus, the ushers will come and we'll receive our offering at that time. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Amen. Well, let's all stand and give it a shot this morning. <laughs> Page number 323. Amen. Hymn 323. More about Jesus. Hymn 323. More about Jesus would I know. Shake hands if you want to.
fourth verse. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Well, that went pretty smooth, and we'll get more used to it as we go, amen? Very good. Well, praise the Lord for it. Let's see, Brother Victor, could you uh, pray for our offering this morning? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, just uh, thankful for this church that we get to come to, Lord, to worship you as as we know you would see fit. Um, Lord, just take this offering, use it, and stretch it for your honor and your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Somehow it of you I 
understand what it's like to walk these roads. My problems don't compare to that crown you had to wear, yet you take them as your own. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know that kind of loneliness. Your spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all the pain and buried all the shame. Rugged tree, your righteous throne. Because of you, I'll never walk alone. You carry. Thank the Lord for what he did for us on Calvary. Amen. Because of him, we'll never walk alone. And that's a blessing. Amen. The Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you're saved here this morning, you have a companion for life and for eternity. And if you're not saved this morning, you can come to know him as your Savior so you can have that companion in life and eternity as well. Take your Bible this morning. I forgot to announce a while ago that we are starting choir practice back today. And all the choir members said, <laughs> we are so out of practice, aren't we? Five o'clock sharp. And we'll start working on our music for, for Resurrection Sunday and GSA. So we've got about, oh, three or four weeks to kind of get ourselves back into the swing of things. Amen? Amen? And if you're interested in being in the choir and haven't been before, you can come tonight and we'll talk about it. And if, if you would like to be in the choir, if you're a member of the church and want to sing with the choir, we'll see what we can do about that. Amen? Amen. And if you have been a choir member, don't skip out. We need everybody we can. Amen. Very good. Take your Bible this morning then and turn to the book of Nahum. Nahum. It is in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's right after Micah, right before Zephaniah, if that helps you at all. Or as we would say in Mexico and Puerto Rico, it's somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. It is one of the minor prophets. Being a minor prophet does not mean that they were less important than the major prophets. It just means their book was shorter. <laughs> Nahum chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 7. If you found your place and can, would you stand with us in honor of the word of God this morning. Nahum chapter 1. Verses 1 through 7. The Bible says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the 
El Koshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way, his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him. And the hills melt, and the earth is burned in his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Wow, that's very encouraging this morning, isn't it? But look at verse number 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. We're going to focus in on verse number 7, though we'll use the whole passage uh, throughout the message, but we're going to focus on verse number 7. The Lord is good. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person present today. Thank you, Lord, for visitors. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the buses being up today. And pray that you would continue to bless in those areas. And ask, Lord, that you would be with us now. Add your blessing to the reading of your word. And, Lord, help me as I preach today. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Hide me behind the cross. And, Lord, help me to say only the things that you would have me to say. And Lord, may your word go out this morning and fall upon hearing ears. And Lord, help us to respond accordingly to the things that we have today before us. Watch over us. If there's one here this morning that's not saved, pray, Lord, that you would save that soul. And Lord, if there's one here away from you, that they would come back to you today. And Lord, that when we leave here, we will, have, we will be able to say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Of course, the, most of the prophets' books were named after them. That's kind of logical. They wrote the book. It's named after them. Amen? Those books were not written to churches like in the New Testament, Therefore, the names of the books in the New Testament, especially the epistles, were named after the church that the book was written to or the person that it was written to. But in the Old Testament, particularly in the books of the prophets, the major and minor prophets, the name of the prophet is the name of the book. So if I ask you this morning, who wrote the book of Nahum? Nahum. I gave you the answer beforehand, didn't I? Huh? The interesting thing about this especially when we look at these first six verses of this book that are pretty strong words. The Lord will not acquit the wicked. What does the word acquit mean? Pardon, forgive. Now, we're glad that God does forgive, right? He forgives sinners. That repent, but those that do not repent are not forgiven. They're not acquitted. They're held culpable of their crimes or their sins. But Nahum's name means comfort <laughs> or consolation. It's almost the opposite of what he writes about. And I think that's very interesting. Because God always uses the personality of the person writing the book. Amen. He uses their personality, their education level. He uses them as they are. That's encouraging to us because God uses us the way we are. 
And, and so as we go through some of this, keep in mind that the writer of the book's name means comfort and consolation. So in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulties, even national problems, we find consolation and comfort in the Word of God. And so we read there in the first phrase of the book, it says, the burden of Nineveh. Now, where have we heard that name before? In the book of Jonah. Jonah was called by God to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah didn't like that idea. Jonah got on a boat going the opposite direction. God sent a storm. The men on the boat, the sailors, threw Jonah overboard at Jonah's request. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd be asking anybody to throw me overboard in the middle of a storm <laughs> or in any other time. And then, then God sent the first submarine. <laughs> That's for all you Navy guys this morning. Amen. <laughs> that giant fish swallowed Jonah. And took him back toward where he was supposed to be. And then God gave him indigestion. That's what a lot of preachers do to people, isn't it? No, I'm just kidding. And he spit Jonah out. And Jonah took off running and, and traveled a couple days, a journey in one day. And come into that city. And the Bible says it was a great city. And he cried out against that city. And what happened? They repented. And they got saved. And Jonah was thrilled. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> he was mad about that. And he complained to God about it. And then, of course, we know God gave the gourd, and then the gourd dried up. Jonah was mad about that, too. Jonah was a grumpy old preacher. But at least his preaching... Through the word of God, folks responded and were saved. So when we read here the burden of Nineveh, why is that there? What reason do we have or did Naaman have to specify that this was the burden of Nineveh? Well, because about a hundred years later now, after Jonah, Nineveh is back at it. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and Assyria had attacked Israel and all kinds of things, taking them captive and multiple things that they had done to Israel. And, and now, uh, just like in the days of Jonah, God is prescribing vengeance upon the people that attacked his people. Are you with me so far? So if you want to say the book of Nahum, Nahum is a sequel to the book of Jonah. And while Nahum's message is one of judgment and wrath, there is that one bright spot in verse number 7. In the midst of all the words of wrath and anger and doom, verse 7 stands out like a shining beacon of hope in a dark day. So I want to take verse number 7, again we'll use the whole passage here, but focus on verse number 7, the Lord is good. So first of all, I want you to see this morning that we have a heavenly assurance. See, if we take our eyes off the Lord and look at our society, America is not a whole lot different than Assyria. America has turned her back on God. We've kicked him out of everything we possibly can as a nation. And now we've come to a point, and, and, and we all know this through this last year, we have seen all kinds of things that we never thought we would see take place. Especially 
when we talk about the church. Now again, I'm glad that we're in Texas. We've pretty much been able to do for the most part what we normally do. There's been a few times where we've had to close down and a few times we went a few months without having in-person services. But for the most part, our governor, our state, even our city has allowed us to proceed with caution and not be locked down like some other states have. I'm glad we can sing without being fined for it. Or at least I'm glad we can make a joyful noise. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to get our buses going again. There's churches out in California still meeting in the parking lot. Because if they go inside, they're going to be fined $5,000 for every service. That's $15,000 a Sunday and another $5,000 on Wednesday, $20,000 a week in fines. Well, that's just America. Canada, they're arresting preachers for passing out gospel tracts on the street now. Those things weren't happening a year ago. We weren't even necessarily worried about those kinds of things happening a year ago. Last March the 8th, tomorrow, will be one year we celebrated the Chadwick's 25th anniversary at the church. It was a wonderful day. Tiring day, but it was a good day. Then March the whatever the next Sunday was, the 15th, we had regular services. And then the world went crazy. Well, I guess we didn't have regular service that Sunday. So really one year ago tomorrow, the world went bananas. Well, at least publicly <laughs> went bananas. It had gone crazy before that. But in the middle of all of the stuff that was going on here in, in, in Nahum's time, the, the revenge and the fury and the anger and the wrath and talks about whirlwinds and storms and rebuking and drying up rivers and, and, and mountains falling and all of the prophecy that was given there about Assyria in the middle of that verse 7 says again the Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble and I love the last part and he knoweth them that trust in him see we have assurance from the God of heaven that even in the middle of the craziness God is still good whether we face the, the lockdowns or the, or the putting folks in jail or the fining of the church, whether that comes to us or not, we need to remember the Lord is good. Whether they say we have to go backwards, which I really pray they don't, because I think as particularly Texans take that step into normalcy again, we're not going to want to go backwards. I didn't want to go backwards in the first place. The word good, what does that mean? It means pleasant, agreeable, rich, valuable. The word describes the very character of God. In fact, our English word is a shortened form of the word good. Circumstances may say otherwise, but the Lord is good. Regardless of the circumstance, the Lord is good. The Lord's good when everything is going great. When the church house is full and the offerings are up and people are coming on the buses and visitors are coming to church and, and everything is hunky-dory. The Lord is good. But if disaster strikes... 
the Lord is good. If illness comes, the Lord is good. Even in death, the Lord is good. Are, are we living in some hard, difficult times? Yes, but the Lord is good. In fact, he's good to all people in all places, in all situations, and at all times. According to Psalm 145, 9. In spite of how things look, feel, or appear, the Lord is good. We're not always good. But we have the assurance from the God of heaven that regardless of the situation, the circumstances, the conditions of life, whether it's our physical being or whether it's our, our nation in the shape that we're in today, in, in regardless of the circumstance or the situation, the Lord is good. He's been good this whole year. Sometimes it's been hard to see His goodness. Amen? Seems on every turn, something didn't go our way. And then for most Christians, November 3rd was a disaster. But the Lord is good. <laughs> Boys and girls, when you have tests at school, the Lord is good whether you pass or fail. Didn't change his goodness, did it? No, when problems come, when trials come, we need to consider. Psalms 34, 8, the Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 100, verse number 5, the Bible says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and truth, and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 135, 3, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. See, we need to remember what Romans 8, 28 says. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. You say, well, I don't know if God's called me to anything specific. He called you to be a Christian. And he gave you a purpose of getting the gospel to the world as a Christian. So if you love him and are called according to his purpose, then all things work together for good. Well, we think about men like Joseph. Joseph had a dream. And in his dream, everybody was bowing to him. Right? The sheaves and then the moon and the stars representing even his mother and father. And that caused his brothers just to love him a whole lot. No, the Bible says they hated him even the more. Wow. They hated him so much they wanted to kill him. If it wasn't for Reuben, they would have. But instead of killing him, they put him in a pit and then sold him into slavery. Sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. Went down to Egypt, got into a man's home named Potiphar. And God blessed him. And he became the ruler over Potiphar's house. He was the ruler over everything except Potiphar and himself and his wife. Well, then his wife set her eyes on Joseph. And then accused him. Then he wound up where? In prison? That sounds good. Right? Now, we know the end of the story if you know the Bible. He was down in prison and God blessed him and he became like the ruler over the prison underneath the prison guard. Because God blessed him. And then one day two guys were thrown down in prison that came from Pharaoh's house. 
the baker and the butler. And then they had a dream. Joseph told them what their dream was, and the one that was set free, he asked him, when you get back to Pharaoh's house, would you remember me? And guess what? He didn't remember. Until one day when Pharaoh had a dream. Oh, man, I forgot about, there's a guy down in prison that interpreted my dream, and he can probably interpret yours too. And the Bible says they had to shave him and clean him up before he could go see Pharaoh. Those sounded like good days that Joseph went through. Years Joseph spent in slavery in prison. But Joseph knew this. The end of the book of Genesis, Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See, Joseph had a spirit about him that we need to have about us. That regardless of the situation, circumstance, or condition that we find ourselves in, the Lord is good. <laughs> wow. It's easy to say that when everything's going good. The difficulty in it is when everything has fallen apart and nothing seems to be going right. Well, that sounds like our day. But the Lord is still good all the time and in every way. The Lord is good. Number two, we have heavenly assistance. First, we have heavenly assurance from the Word of God itself that God is good. Then we have heavenly assistance. Nahum reminds the embattled people of God that God is a stronghold in the day of trouble. The word stronghold means a place of safety, protection, and refuge, a safe harbor in the storm. I was always amazed. As many times as we went, it was still amazing to me to see those forts in San Juan. You had one called El Morro, and then you had one called the Fort of uh, San Cristobal, or Cristobal Colon. That means Christopher Columbus. And those, those forts were amazing. Some of the walls were 150 feet high. And they were all about four to six feet thick. The one fort took almost 200 years to build completely. And those men in that day, they were pretty, pretty intelligent fellows especially to have not had the internet or YouTube to tell them how to build it. <laughs> That's how we learn things today, right? If you don't know how to do something, look it up on YouTube. There's a video about it. They didn't have that. But they were wise enough and smart enough, at least somebody was, to know how to build those forts. It was a literal fortification. And they did it in, a, in an area where you would come into a bay and on the other side there was like a peninsula and they built a small fort on the other side that was not as visible. And when ships would come in to try to attack the city, they would try to stay away from the big fort because of the big cannons, but they didn't realize there was a little one with cannons on the other side and they would sink out there in that bay. It's amazing, the history. And to see those walls and to see the, the enormity of a fort, a stronghold. And we have the promise from the word of God that God is our stronghold in a day of trouble. And, and he is our hiding place. He is our refuge. He is where we can seek shelter from the storm. Sooner or later, we will all need a stronghold. Trouble will come eventually. You say, well, that's real positive. Well, Job said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. I didn't say that. The Lord did. 
through Job. And, and, and we know what happened to Job. And once again, Job proves that if we trust in the Lord, that everything turns out for good. He lost everything. His wife told him to curse God and die. But he stayed faithful to God. The Bible says he didn't sin with his lips. In other words, he didn't grumble and gripe or accuse God. Boy, aren't we fast to do those three things. Mm -hmm. That's free. didn't cost you anything this morning. It speaks of the times of life when life closes in around us and the pressures of life comes against us. In those times, the people of God have a stronghold. We have a refuge. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 27, the Bible says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Psalm 27, 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 18.10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Isaiah 43.2, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? Because he is with us. He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. No matter what comes or what goes, the Lord is good. It says in verse 2 that God is jealous. Now when we think of jealousy, is it a good or bad thing? Bad. Human jealousy is a sin, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the Bible says that God is jealous. That doesn't imply that he's guilty of a sin. He's not afraid of losing us or afraid that someone will take us away from him or do some evil. We are his, and no one can ever change that. Praise the Lord. If you're saved, you are God's. What it does mean is that God views us as a precious possession. And his jealousy, if you want to say, is his protection of his possession. What parent here or grandparent here this morning would not do whatever it took to protect your child or your grandchild? And that's in our human ability. Imagine what God would do to protect his own. It's amazing when you think about it. It means that he places himself between us and the problem or us and the trial, between us and the enemy. We do have an enemy, by the way, and his name is the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But thank God, God is our refuge. He's our stronghold. And if, if the devil tries to do things to us, just like with Job, he has to have God's permission. Amen. God's children are precious to him. And he does whatever it takes to protect and keep us safe. Does that mean harm will never come to a child of God? No. It doesn't mean, no matter what the prosperity gospel preachers say, it doesn't mean if you get saved, all your problems are gone forever. Doesn't mean that if you get saved, your, your debt is forgiven. Not what it means. Does it mean that cancer is not going to come to you? Does it mean that some, some 
illness or some problem or some trial is not going to come. It just means that in that trial, we have a refuge. We have a stronghold. We have a hiding place. We have someone that we can go to with that need or that problem or that trial because the Lord is good. Wow. The storms of life may come. Adversity may come. But we have a place that we can go to. He knoweth the way that I take, according to Job 23. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. I want you to see the absolute admission that trials will come. He said, when I am tried. He wasn't saying that God would not allow those things to come, but when they come, I shall come forth as gold. Huh? David had the same attitude in Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. We need to learn to trust the Lord even when trials and tribulations come. You say, Pastor, what is all this about? America. We're living in uncharted waters. We've never passed this way before. Our, our history, they've never faced what we're facing. Not that they didn't face some troubles and some trials. Our country would not exist without a battle for freedom. But we're in a day that we have come to, we have regressed like Assyria had and gone away from God and forgotten the goodness of God as a nation. And I want to challenge us this morning as a church to remember the Lord is good. Amen. Yes, we live in dangerous times. Yes, we live in the middle of some chaos. Thank the Lord that some of it is beginning to slow down. But have you heard the comments that have been said about Governor Abbott and the other 15 governors that have opened their states? People hate it. Saying that they are causing death to come to people. And who knows what else has been said about those men. But regardless of what is said, regardless of what comes to pass, we have a Lord that is good. So we have a heavenly assurance. We have heavenly assistance. And the last thing this morning, we have a heavenly acquaintance. Look at the last of verse number 7 again. Let's just read all of verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Can I say to you this morning, the Lord knows if you're trusting in him or not. Let me say that again. The Lord knows if we are trusting in him or not. See, I think a lot of Christians' faith was tested this last year. And we found out who people trust. Yeah, we did. There were a lot of folks that were operating on sure, sheer fear and not fear of the Lord. Some on fear of government. Amen. Some on fear of a disease. Some on fear of the pandemic, whatever you want to call it. And we had to come to a place in our own lives. And we all have to come to that place at one time or another that we decide who we're going to trust. We either trust the Lord or we don't. But the Lord knows us. Amen. 
The word knoweth means to know intimately, to know by experience. The word trust means to flee for protection or to trust in God. Hmm. I'm, I'm glad as we're studying on Wednesday nights through the model prayer, I'm glad that the first phrase of that model prayer is our Father. The Bible tells in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, and I won't quote them, but we know that it says that the Lord knows his sheep. Amen. And they follow him. And they know his voice. See, it, it's, not, it's not some, well, let me put it this way. Some folks call God the man upstairs. Can I say to you, he's far more than the man upstairs. He is our father. He's acquainted with us. The Bible tells us that Jesus was acquainted with our grief. He knows our sorrows. He's been through what we've been through. And we can go to him and have an acquaintance, a fellowship, a personal relationship with our father. God knows us. He knows our name. He knows where we are. He even knows how many hairs we have on our head. And that's getting less and less for me. Somebody said it this way. If your hair is falling out, at least you know the Lord has to come and count them once a day. <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but I know he knows how many hairs we have on our head. Huh? He knows us better than we know ourselves. Listen to this. He knows you intimately, comprehensively, and completely. There's nothing about you, your life, your situation, your circumstance, your condition that has escaped his attention. He knows you. He knows me. Like Hagar, when she fled from Abraham in Genesis 21, God knows everything about you. He knew where she was. He heard the lad, the Bible says. He knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. Amen? Just so you know, the Lord's people are more than just dumb, defenseless, directionless sheep. We're elevated beyond that. John 15, he calls us his friend. Amen. It's an acquaintance. The word friends mean, means an associate. Huh. Think about this one. The Lord wants to associate with you. <laughs> we have people around us that we don't want to associate with. Amen? Well, at least I do. <laughs> you probably do too. Somebody says that certain name and the first thing you think is <laughs> Hey, you're not any different than me and I'm not any different than you. But aren't you glad when somebody calls out your name to the Lord he doesn't say you. He loves us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to associate with us. He is our shepherd. And he is our friend. We are called the beloved. We are his brethren. The word brethren means those of the same womb. In John chapter 3 verse 16, he told Nick, or in chapter 3, he told Nicodemus that he must be Born again. See, when we come to Christ and ask Him to forgive us of our sin and put our faith and trust in Him, we are born again. 
We become part of God's family. It has nothing to do with religion, affiliation. It has nothing to do with the denomination. It has everything to do with a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are his child or you are not. You are born into his family or you have not been. You are adopted by God or you have not been. There is no two ways about it. You are either saved, a born again child of God, or you are not and you are a child of the devil and on your way to the devil's hell, according to the scripture. But thank God when we come to him and turn to him in faith, and trust Him as our personal Lord and Savior. As the old preacher said, we get born again. And we're part of His family. And we have hope because we have a heavenly acquaintance with God. And that gives us hope in the day of trouble. God's jealous. He revengeth, he's furious, he gets vengeance on his adversaries. At least that's the scripture that we read this morning. But thank God in all of that. And by the way, America will not escape the judgment of God. A nation cannot murder babies the way we murder babies and God not judge the nation for it. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, can I say if that's true, then the opposite is as well. Cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. America's God is no longer the Lord. It's money and pleasure and anything else except God. And church, can I say to us today, we ought not live that way. We ought to make God first in our lives and draw near to him because there is coming a day when God's judgment will be poured out on America and this whole world. And if you're not saved, then you will be part of that judgment. But thank God if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, the trumpet's going to sound one day and we're going home. And while all of the judgments being poured out on this world, we'll be in heaven with the Lord. Going through our own judgment, but not for our sin, but for the things that we did in our body, whether they were good or evil. Can I say to you this morning, America is a mess. I love America. I'm glad I'm in Texas. I'm, I'm slowly adapting. A little faster than slow, I think. But regardless if we're from Texas or what, troublesome times are here. Filling men's heart with fear. What the song says, isn't it? But can I say to you in all of that, The Lord is good. Do you know him this morning? Is he your personal Lord and Savior? Or are you trusting in something else? Trusting in church membership, religious affiliation, trusting in what your grandparents were or your great-grandparents? Or are you trusting in the Lord? Can I say again the last phrase of that verse number 7 says, He knoweth them that trust in Him. See, the Lord knows if you're saved or not. And most likely, you do too. Don't wait until it's too late. If you don't know Him, come to Him. If you're away from him, come home. That was the encouragement of the prodigal son. His father didn't make him a servant. 
he celebrated him as a son who had come home. See, if you're away from the Lord, and you don't have to be out in the world to be away from the Lord. You could be right here this morning as far from God as you can be because your heart's not here today. Whatever the circumstance, whether you're saved and you're trying to live for the Lord the best you can, you're away from the Lord, or maybe you're not even saved this morning. The promise is still true for all three of those. The Lord is good. Amen. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Father, we love you today. And Lord, thank you so much that as we look into your word, Lord, we see that troubles will come. Trials will come. Nations turn their back on God. It's nothing new. But Lord, we're living in a day and time that is very strange to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would take your word this morning and encourage your people to know and trust that the Lord is good. Lord, help those that are away from you to come back to you. And Lord, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, May today be that day that they would trust you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray you have your will and way in our invitation time this morning. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you come this morning? Maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Would you come down and let me talk to you a minute and get someone to show you from the Bible how you can know you're saved? If you're away from him, why don't you come home this morning, Brother Tim? Sing the chorus with us this morning. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Pray the message was an encouragement to us. Amen. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Brother Jonathan, could you come up and dismiss us in prayer? Don't forget choir practice at 5 o'clock. That cuts your nap time a little short. But the Lord is good. <laughs> Amen. Brother Jonathan. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Give us, Lord, I do pray that uh, you give us a good day. Lord, thank you for letting us be in church this morning. Father, I do pray that the message that Pastor brought us, Lord, be encouragement to our hearts. Lord, do thank you for being good to us. Lord, I pray that you'll give us a good, safe afternoon. Bring us back here tonight to worship you. In your name I pray. Amen. You already standing. Never mind. If you'll go with me in your hymnal to 244, Amazing Grace, hymn 244. Amazing Grace, how 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. We'll see you tonight. Tonight, six, part five.